Hello and welcome to Geology. I'm, I am Robert Lopez and today I'm going to talk about mostly on weathering. And all right, Let's look at weathering now. So weathering is a really important part of sedimentary rocks because weathering again is going to bring us the raw materials to make the sedimentary rocks. And uh, there's again, again there's that two types of weathering and I'm going to focus more on, on each of these here. So physical weathering is a disintegration. Think of it as having uh, larger pieces and you're breaking them down into smaller pieces, right? So you're going from, from something that's gravel size to something that's sand size and something, something that's mud size. In fact, these are the, 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 the classed, so remember class means a broken particle, classed size rating. And the size ratings, we're only, I'm only going to really ask you these three. There's gravel size, sand size, and mud size. And the difference being uh, that gravel size is going to be coarser than 2 millimeters, bigger. Whereas sand size is anywhere between 2 millimeters and 1 16th of a millimeter. Once you get down to 1 16th of a millimeter, this is hard to see. You, you would need a, a microscope, a hand lens to see the grains over here. Um, and then there is a distinction between, in, in this mud size, which between silt and clay. Clay is a little bit gritty, whereas, I'm sorry, silt is gritty, and clay will be smooth. So we can add those words here. So this is, this is gritty. You can feel the silty, gritty material, especially if you, if you rub the rock, you'll feel that gritty, that gritty silt, even though it would be hard to see the individual grains, whereas clay is smooth. And um, we mentioned that because one thing that we look at, especially up in here, uh, uh, you can think of this as a, the, the source rock. So this is where, where it's being eroded or weathered from and then, er and then being transported, eroded. So the farther you go on this path here, right, um, that means uh, uh, the longer time it takes to break the, round, the rock down to these smaller pieces. So uh, when you get to clay size over here, we're going to have this as a uh, uh, lo longest, uh, we'll call it longest history as sediment. So in other words, this is the clay, in order to get into the clay size, it's been around a long time, been around a long time. So it's had more history, more things have happened to it. It's traveled farthest from its source area. That's another important point. And then your book also points out that in the gravel size ratings, there's these things called pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. Pebbles are, are any from, from anywhere from 2 to 64 millimeters, about 3 inches. So remember, 64 millimeters, that's our lapilli size. So that's something we can remember, right? And then um, uh, cobbles are 64 to 256 millimeters. And anything coarser than 256 millimeters would be boulders, right? So uh, uh, as we keep going down with um, physical weathering, Remember, physical weathering is a mechanical breakdown, right? And I mentioned that these clasts are these broken fragments, right? So when you look at a sandstone, every, every grain of sand in that sandstone is a clast. It's a broken fragment that's now stuck together in this new rock, right? So um, your book has a section here on joints. And joints are fractures in rocks where there's no slippage. Because once you get slippage on that fracture, you have a fault. And so we're not there yet. We'll talk about faults later on. But a joint is a, 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 a fracture where there has been no slip. And we've already talked about columnar jointing. Uh, other types of jointing could be uh, where there's overburdened pressure. Because remember, these rocks, have to, to, to make them, you got to bury them, com compact them, cement them. So they're, they're, they're buried. And so they're, they're under pressure. And now you expose these rocks to the surface, they're going to expand, right? So you get these like expansion jointing or pressure release jointing. Um, sheeting joints, again, same thing, you, especially for granitic. This is common to, um, to uh, uh, gr granitic rocks, granites uh, or, or plutons, right? The plutons, they're buried and, you know, anywhere, they're buried around 10 kilometers deep. So that's where they form in magma chambers. But now those, those granites, like in Yosemite, lots of plutons up there, they were once buried uh, 6, 7, 8, 10 kilometers. Now they're up here at the surface. So they stretch out and exfoliate, right? In fact, a, a good example of exfoliation are, is like half dome. Half, half dome is an example of an exfoliated dome 
Um, once buried, now it's sort of expanding through this exfoliation. But whatever the origin, right? Whatever the origin, joint formation turns formerly intact rock into separate blocks. And in those separate blocks, there's those fractures where water can percolate in there uh, and, and, and cause these things to kind of topple over, right? So these topple over to form talus slopes, right? So uh, I have a little cartoon here. Here's a mountainside. And over time, these, these fractures jointing, causing these big blocks to come down. And you get this apron of material that forms at the base of the hill called a talus apron, right? So if you look at our PowerPoint, we have a couple of points that they show here. So here they're showing uh, uh, some granite that's starting to become weathered, right? We'll say more about this in a moment. And then uh, there's a section here on the, on the jointing. So uh, here are some some uh, expansion joints in a, in, a, in a sedimentary rock, right? And you're starting to form this talus slope right in here. Here's some rock here that's fractured, breaking up, and you get a nice little talus apron right in here. And then uh, here's some sheeting or exfoliation joints that are that are in, occurs in granite right here. Like in, like in Yosemite, you see a lot of this she, uh, exfoliation or sheet joints. Look at the types of physical weathering, right? So the first one is this frost wedging. And we know that, that in the liquid form, uh, there's an angle between the, the, you know, one thing about water molecule, it's polar, right? It's positive on one side and negative on the other one. That's what makes water uh, the universal solvent. It can dissolve just about anything given enough time because it has this, this positive and negative nature, right? Um, but the water molecule, when it's in the liquid form, it has about a 105 degree angle between the two hydrogen ions, right? But when it freezes, when it turns into solid, that angle converts to or changes to 109 degrees. So basically, there's, there's a volume expansion. So what that means is that when water percolates into these joints here, and it freezes overnight, especially in the High Sierra, it's going to expand and cause these blocks to topple over, right? And they'll topple over, crack, and eventually lead to tailless slopes on the front of this. So frost wedging is one type of, um, of me mechanical or physical weathering. Another one is kind of the same idea. Uh, by the ocean, sea spray, uh, uh, waves crashing into the shore can bring salt water up onto rocks. The water will evaporate away and crystals will grow in cracks or crevices of the rocks or joints and kind of force those, expand them apart and break down the rock that way. Uh, plant root action, um, I usually call it plant root action, that would be where, where trees or, 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 or brush roots uh, will penetrate into these joints and expand the joints, so that's another expansion there. Uh, thermal expansion, heat from fires, uh, uh, the rock can get so hot that it will expand and then upon cooling will fracture. Also, there are cases in the desert where black rock gets so hot that it, that it fractures into these sheets. And then there's also um, animal attack, right? There could be bioturbation, right? So worms burrowing in the soil, rodents, gophers uh, breaking up the rock. And then people, we're, we're one of the most uh, active uh, uh, mechanical uh, weathering uh, animals on earth, right? We build these core or make these cores, build road cuts, buildings, excavations, and we really have changed the face of the planet. So going back to our PowerPoint point here, we see that we have the frost wedging. Uh, uh, here, uh, 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 this bush, is, its roots are growing in here, coming out of here. Eventually, it's going to spall this piece of rock off. They'll tumble down and make this talus slope in here, right? There's a talus slope. And then uh, salt, right? So here's salt wedging led to disintegration of gravestones here in England. So for chemical weathering, here we have a decomposition, right? Decomposition. So it's a chemical breakdown by removing components. You're either completely dissolving the thing or you're, you're removing some components and, and leaving others and changing the mineral uh, uh, over time, right? Uh, that's left behind. So dissolution, that's the first one. Dissolution is a type of chemical weathering where you completely dissolve the material. And some of the easier materials to be dissolved are going to be the, the ionic compounds. 
and because these are relatively weak bonds, and uh, uh, for halite, calcite, gypsum are good examples. They, if you look at the composition of seawater, there's going to be sulfate ion, carbonate ion, sodium, and chloride, right? So obviously they're, they're comp compounds that are dissolved in water. Uh, another really important one is this hydrolysis. And hydrolysis, uh, it, it, well, in Greek it means water loosening, right? Water loosening. Sometimes you can leach it with a weak acid, uh, but the key thing, hydrolysis affects the feldspar minerals. And that's important because feldspar is just about in every type of rock you have. Every type of rock you're going to find is going to have some variety of feldspar. It's a very abundant mineral on Earth's surface. So if you combine feldspars with water, you make these clay minerals. Uh, in fact, kaolin or kaolinite, pottery uh, uh, clay. That's one of the byproducts of, especially when you, when you, um, uh, uh, when you hydrolyze potassium or orthoclase feldspar, right? You make these, these clay minerals. And then a secondary component is you have the silica solution that's left behind. And later on, that silica solution goes into groundwater and will precipitate between sand grains to cement the, these grains to make sandstone and other sedimentary rocks, right? So that's an important source of a cement for making um, the lithification process. Chemical weathering uh, is oxidation, and that's basically adding oxygen or rusting, and primarily that's going to affect the mafic minerals, olivine, pyroxene, hornblende, biotite mica. So those end up getting uh, oxidized over time. So feldspars get oxidized, uh, get hydrolyzed, uh, mafic minerals get oxidized. And then um, one that's not as common is hydration. Some minerals can absorb water, especially some clays, and they expand, um, but that's not as important. Now, um, in this example here, what happens to granite when it's weathering? Well, we know the feldspars here are gonna gonna experience hydrolysis. So basically, they're we can say they're gone, weathered, chemically weathered away. Uh, the hornblende and biotite mica in a granite will be oxidized. So basically, they're gone too over time. Quartz. We're going to say that this is um, not affected. So quartz is an unusual mineral, and it's not affected. It's not affected by by chemical weathering. It's not oxidized. It's not hydrolyzed. Uh, I usually call this the the omega mineral because it survives these chemical weathering systems. And so, where does the quartz end up? The quartz ends up on beaches. Uh, in fact, and they're very common to passive margins. Because, like, for example, if you go to the beaches here in California, you find feldspars and little biotite micas on there, which means the beaches here in California are, are, are from an active margin. They're not very old. But if you go to North Carolina or Florida and you look at the beaches there, they're all white and they're composed of primarily quartz sand. And that means that all these other guys that used to be here, they're gone, right? So passive margin beaches uh, or quartz uh, uh, sands are really um, indicative of a passive margin tectonic setting. I have this word saprolite. Saprolite describes a, a, a weathered granite, a weathered decomposing granite for this, for this process here. 